now that we've covered kind of the core functional programming infrastructure aspects of Java 8 and beyond, we're going to start shifting into the real focus of the class, which is parallel functional programming. That's where we're headed with this stuff. Before we get to the parallel functional programming part, however, I'm going to give you a little overview of what concurrency is, so you'll know what that concept family looks like. And then we're also going to talk about what parallelism is, so you'll understand how that compares and contrasts with concurrency. And then I'll give you a bunch of examples of concurrent and parallel support that's in Java. So if you take the course in the spring that I teach, which is going to be called something like Concurrent Object-Oriented Programming once we finish getting it into the catalog, uh, that course will focus on concurrency. This course focuses on parallelism. But a lot of times people get confused between the difference. So I'm going to spend a little time comparing and contrasting that. So I'm going to explain the concept of concurrency right now. And I'll talk about how concurrency is supported in Java, at least a little bit. And then we'll go into that in more detail later. So concurrency is a form of computing where one or more threads can run simultaneously. And I guess actually two or more threads can run simultaneously. You need, you need two of something to really be concurrent. And here's a little bit of syntax that we're going to use just to make this clear. The, uh, the gray round angle is a process. A process is a unit of resource allocation and protection. And within a process, there can be one or more threads. And threads are the units of execution. So a thread is a unit of execution for streams of instructions that can run concurrently on one or more processor cores. And in Java, hopefully as you understand by now, at least at a high level, you get a thread by saying new thread giving it some computation, which could be a lambda expression or a runnable or whatnot, and then you start that thread. So that's basically how you get things up and running with, with Java threads. And as you can see here, there's multiple threads running in a process, and they can run on top of multiple cores. That's, that's my icon for core. Typically, we use concurrent processing or concurrency to offload work from the foreground thread, which is sometimes called the main thread or the user interface thread and so on, to one or more background threads. And this is particularly important, of course, in modern mobile devices where you've got a user interface that's the way in which we interact with the, the user of the device, like a tablet or a smartphone or a watch or whatever. And uh, that's where the, the user-facing interactions take place, presenting output, prompting for input. But then the actual real work, the real computations to do something that doesn't get done instantly, that runs for a long time, like downloading an image or doing some kind of searching operation or whatever, uh, that takes place in one or more background threads. And uh, these, just to give an example, there's, um, if you look at Android, that's the way that Android works. If you look at iOS, it works pretty much the same way. There's a user interface thread that doing the GUI stuff, and then there's background threads that do longer running operations. And we'll talk about some of those things. We won't talk a whole lot about Android in this class, but if you come back in the spring, we'll talk about a cool Android framework called the Async Task Framework that works just like this. So given this distinction between background thread, background threads and a foreground thread, the main distinction is that the background threads can block while they're doing their computations. So if they're doing a long-running computation or they're going and you know, downloading stuff from a website somewhere or accessing records in a database, whatever they're doing, they can, they can afford to block. And that's because they're in the background. So they're not going to perturb or disrupt the responsiveness to the user. So background threads can block. Conversely, the user interface thread can't block. Or if it does block, it has to block for an incredibly short period of time. No unbounded blocking is allowed in the user interface thread. And in fact, on Android, by default, if you try to do blocking operations from the user interface thread, like you try to you know, open a network connection and download things from the internet, the, the system will actually throw an exception by default and say, hey, you can't call a networking call on the user interface thread. That could block. And if you block the user interface thread, you get this application not responding 
error that pops up. If you're, you've used Android and you have a misbehaving app, sometimes you get this application not responding error. So that's the basic idea. Background threads do long-running computations or I.O. operations can block. User interface thread, of which there's one, doesn't block. OK, so that's the big picture view. So concurrency in Java. In Java, the way you get concurrency out of the box is by using a thread. And a thread is an object. It's an instance of a class. There's a thread class. And the thread objects, you know, when you make a thread, when you create a thread and you start the thread and so on, that object contains methods. It contains fields. Each Java thread has certain properties, certain fields, certain state that's distinct from other threads. Good examples would be things like they have their own runtime stack for any methods that calls that take place in that thread. Likewise, they have their own internal registers for doing computations. They have their own thread-specific storage, instruction pointers, all that kind of good stuff. A thread can also be in one of various states. So it's a little beyond the scope of this class to go into all these states. We'll cover this in the spring. But there's basically about, I don't know, a half dozen or so different states that a thread can be in. When it's first created, it's in the new state. When you start it, it becomes runnable. When the thread scheduler decides to actually run it on a core, it becomes running. As it's running, it may end up waiting on something, in which case it goes into the waiting state. Or it may do a timed wait. It goes into a timed waiting state. Or it may try to block on something to get access to a, a lock, in which case it goes into the block state. And during the lifetime of a thread, it keeps transitioning around these different states, depending on what it's actually doing. And at some point, it falls off the, the run method, which is the enter, entry point hook into the, the thread itself. And then it becomes terminated. And its state can be reclaimed by the virtual machine. So that's basically what a, a thread is. Concurrent Java threads can interact via several means. They can interact through sharing of objects within a process, which is called shared objects. Or they can interact by passing messages back and forth between threads, either in the same process or in a different process. For the purpose of this discussion, we're going to focus only on the scenario where all the threads are in the same process. Without loss of generality, you can also have threads communicate within different processes or in one process on one machine with another process on another machine. But we're not going to talk about that right at the moment. Shared objects are typically the most efficient way to share resources. And you typically share objects in such a way where the objects have to be synchronized to make sure that threads or a thread accessing the state of the object from one context, from one thread, or computations accessing the state of the object from one thread don't interfere with computations accessing the state of the object from a different thread. And if you recall, we talked about before the whole concept of, of uh, mutable shared state being the root of all evil in, uh, in concurrent programs. And that's true. And so there's a whole pile of things in Java, lots and lots and lots of stuff, used to enable multiple threads to properly coordinate and synchronize their access to the state of shared, uh, a shared object, an object shared between the threads in the same process. And that's what's called synchronization. And we'll talk about synchronization at de in detail next semester. Some of the key concepts with sharing of objects are the concept of mutual exclusion, which basically says only let one thing at a time access the critical section, the, the shared data, to avoid race conditions. We don't want to corrupt this mutable data. Um, so that's, that's one concept. And I always like to think about mutual exclusion in the form of the restroom on an airplane. So if you've ever flown on an airplane, I, I suspect almost everybody here has flown on an airplane before, they have that restroom, which is either occupied or vacant, right? And it has a little flag. And the rule is if there's, if it's Occupied, you have to wait. If it's vacant, you can go in and you shut the door and it becomes occupied. So one, one in, one out. Mutual exclusion. The other concept that's important for sharing is coordination. And the purpose there is to make sure that operations occur in the right order at the right time 
and under the right conditions. So this is a little different from mutual exclusion. This is making sure that things can coordinate the action. Something runs at some point, it reaches a state where it can't make forward progress without some other thread changing the state. So it'll go ahead and wait, and then another thread will do something when it updates the shared data structure, the other thread can wake up. Uh, a simple example of this would be some kind of bounded buffer program where you've got a queue that's shared between multiple threads, and the rule would be if the queue is empty, then anybody, any thread that wants to take an item from the queue has to wait for the queue to be not empty. And likewise, if you're trying to add something to a queue, because it's a bounded queue, if the queue is full and you're trying to put something on the queue, you have to wait until the queue is not full. So that's an example of coordination. Threads can coordinate their activities. And there's a whole pile of mechanisms in Java for enabling that, things like condition objects and so on. Here's a quick laundry list of Java synchronizers. I won't require you to know these because we're not going to cover them very much at all in this class, but examples would be synchronized statements and methods, reentrant locks and intrinsic locks, which are related to these concepts, atomic operations, semaphores, condition objects, and the very low level lock-free, wait-free synchronizers that are part of the Java virtual machine called compare and swap operations. So really cool stuff. They allow us to do atomic operations. They allow us to do mutual exclusion. They allow us to do coordination. And we're not going to talk about them hardly at all in this class, because this class is about parallelism, not concurrency and synchronization. But this stuff is out there. And by the time you graduate, you should be at least passingly familiar, or hopefully very familiar, with how to program this stuff. And that's what the class in the spring covers. The second paradigm to enable concurrent interaction between multiple threads is message passing. And the idea here is that you have a producer thread, one or more producer threads that create messages, and they publish them, typically through a queue, to one or more consumer threads, which subscribe or receive those messages. And the interactions between producers and consumers take place through some kind of blocking queue just like the queue I was telling you about a second ago, where if you're trying to put something in the queue and the queue is full, you have to wait. If there's a thread that's trying to take something out of the queue and the queue is empty, you have to wait. So you coordinate interactions by passing messages through the queue. And so needless to say that message passing is typically implemented by using a shared object like a blocking queue. But it's done in a very stylized way. There's other ways to interact besides using blocking queues that are more shared object oriented as opposed to message passing oriented. Okay, so there are lots and lots of blocking queues and thread safe queues in Java. So there's array blocking queues, there's link blocking queues, there's priority blocking queues, there's synchronous queues, there's concurrent link queues. The list goes on and on. Uh, once again, we are not going to talk about any of these in any detail in this class because it just doesn't matter for what we're doing. And I'll explain to you in a second why that's the case. Whenever you start using concurrent programming, either with shared objects or message passing, whenever you're trying to coordinate or interact or share or whatever, you have to be very careful that the resources you're sharing are shared safely in order to avoid various hazards. And so I'll, I've kind of hinted at some of these hazards before, but I'll talk about them more here in a second. So, so one of the most obvious hazards is race, are race conditions. When you have sharing, you have to be careful about multiple things coming in there and sort of corrupting the state in ways that are not protected by some type of synchronizer. And it turns out that race conditions, especially in modern multi-core processors, are really subtle because it deals with a lot of things having to do with the way in which a multi-core hardware architecture caches data in the cores in order to speed up computation. And so the, the tricky part there is it's, it's not just about two objects or two threads trying to share some field. It's also about how data moves between caches in a multiprocessor core, uh, in a multi-core processor, multi-core multi -core processor. Um, so race conditions are very subtle. It turns out it's, it's quite easy to avoid them. You either understand synchronizers, in which case your code is correctly protected, or you don't bother sharing data, in which case there's no problem. 
The latter approach is what we're going to focus on in this class. The former approach is what we focus on next year in the spring. If you want to see an example of what happens when you've got race conditions, you might try to run this uh, program. It's called Buggy Q, and it deliberately has a queue that's implemented without synchronization, and it's sharing the queue between multiple threads. And when you run the program, chaos and insanity ensues because it's deliberately buggy. And so it's worth seeing just what happens. There's lots of other examples of buggy code that you can find. Deliberately buggy code. There's probably examples of non-deliberately buggy code somewhere too, but uh, these are things that show the problems quite distinctly. Another problem that arises with concurrent programming is the concept of memory inconsistencies. And this occurs when you have multiple threads on a multi-core processor that have inconsistent views of what should be the same data. And again, this arises because of people not using synchronization properly. It arises because modern multi-core hardware caches things very aggressively to speed up computations in, in the normal case. But that can get you into trouble when you're trying to share stuff. So some metaphors I like to think about uh, depends on what generation of uh, science fiction or fantasy fan you are. If you know Star Trek, there was this concept called the transporter beam. And a transporter beam would transport you from one place to another. And uh, the problem, of course, could occur if you try to transport someone and something goes wrong. So you kind of have them half in one place and half in another, right? You have inconsistency of the state of the person. So that's an example of sort of uh, memory inconsistencies, human inconsistencies. The other example, if you're a more modern fan of fantasy literature like Harry Potter, you might recall the concept of splinching. So if you're going to apparate from one place to another and you don't quite get it right, then you, you, know, you leave your nose behind or you leave your arm behind and they have to come and, and repair you somehow. Uh, so those are examples of inconsistencies. We want things to either be one place or another, but not kind of halfway in between. And that's the metaphor to think of in your head when you think about memory inconsistencies. Yet another problem that arises with concurrent programs is the concept of deadlock or the hazard of deadlock. And this occurs when you have two or more competing threads waiting for each other to finish. Therefore, no one can make any progress whatsoever. This is sometimes called a, a circular embrace or a deadly embrace. Here's a very simple example that illustrates the point. Let's assume we have two threads, thread T1 and thread T2, and we have two locks, lock L1 and lock L2. And in this scenario, T1 owns lock L1 and needs lock L2, and thread T2 owns lock L2 and needs lock L1. And if both threads stubbornly hold on to the lock that they own and then try to get the other lock that they need, they deadlock. And so nobody can make any progress. And this is a surprisingly common problem in programs that are concurrent where they share objects. So again, we won't talk much at all about how to avoid that problem in this class other than not sharing objects. So that turns out to be the easy way to get around the problem. So those are some of the issues that you can run into. Those are the hazards that arise when you start doing concurrent programming. And uh, so the key point you should come away with from this is that concurrent programming is somewhat tricky, and you have to learn about synchronization, and you have to learn about how to deal with race conditions, memory inconsistencies, and deadlocks. Okay.